There's no reason to have stereotypes and, and have negative beliefs. And we have to see all the positives because even if we don't understand how or why somebody is behaving in a certain way with us, there's almost always some positive intent. You know, people are usually, people usually do have good intentions. There's usually positive intent, but we just don't realize where it's coming. I'm delighted to see I'm here with uh, Cheryl Ubal. Um Hi, Cheryl. How, how are you today? Is, uh, is Italy in January less grim than it is in Scotland? I'm imagining so. Well, a little bit less grim, but not too much less grim. It's still cold and cloudy here. It's been raining a lot and it's a tiny bit warmer. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, I would what, take What's the warmer. temperature there? Oh, God knows. Uh, <laughs> Three, four. I, I, I have no idea what is Celsius, but it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not great. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you because you, you're very different from um, other guests that we've had, especially in terms of what you've gone on to do uh, with a TEFL or ESL, whatever you want to call it, qualification. Um, but I want to go, I want to go right to the start. So why teaching English, and, and why was Italy your first port of uh, port of call? Okay, well, that's a little bit of a long story. Actually, mm -hmm. prior to teaching English, I was a professional dancer and choreographer, and I was living in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I had traveled all over the world in my 20s, basically doing different shows, and I worked on cruise ships. I, I probably went to about 50 countries before I was even 27. Wow. Anyway, in one of my dance touring shows, I, we stopped in Italy and I saw a show called Notre Dame de Paris. It's um, an international musical production that was in many countries. And the one in Italy just completely enthralled me. I was enchanted and I really wanted to audition for the show. So I thought, how can I get to Italy and have a way to support myself while I'm waiting for the chance to audition for the show? And somehow I figured out that I could teach English. You know, it's an easy thing to do as a foreigner and, you know, as a mother tongue English speaker in Italy, it was pretty easy to get a job in, in the field of teaching English. So I applied and, and I got a job and I came to Italy and um, the rest is history. I mean, I ended up staying here for many years. I didn't plan to, I was just going to come here for three months. That was the initial oh. plan see if I could have a chance to audition for Notre Dame de Paris. Um, long story short, but I never auditioned for the show. And my whole oh. life changed after moving. Yeah, my whole life changed after moving here. Wow. I mean, we will cover the choreography and, and how that does play into everything. Because I, I firmly believe that that does, you know, that there is a lot intertwined there. Um, so in Italy, you primarily taught was it primarily freelance or was it all freelance after a while? And was it hard to build um, a tutor? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So it was all freelance in the beginning and I worked for adult language schools. There's a lot of private language schools here in Italy mm -hmm. and studying English as an adult, especially like for business purposes is really, really popular here. Mm -hmm. And Italian adults spend a lot of money on, English lessons. And it's, it's really, there's a lot of work for in that part of the English teaching field. So when I first came, I was working for one school, but it was all freelance. And then sooner or later, it's, it's very, very easy to build a network in Italy. Mm -hmm. It's a highly social culture. And after a short time, you make lots of friends. It's just like that. I don't know. I think everybody has this, a similar experience, especially when you're teaching because you're in touch with a lot of different people and you just, you know, they start inviting you to dinner and then you just, all of a sudden you have a lot of friends. So <clears throat> I just started to get asked by many other people and many other schools to teach for them. And suddenly my schedule was so full that I didn't even have like a minute free in the day to do anything. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I've, I've moved to another country. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know even five words of Italian at that time. Now, of course, I'm fluent in Italian. But back then, I, I only knew ciao, pizza, cafe, you know, just very basic. Anyway, so that's how it happened. I started with one school. Then I branched out. And over time, um, I just 
ended up getting so many students that I was able to go off on my own and start my own little business. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll we'll come into the business side of things because obviously that's 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 taken a huge uh, a huge role in in your career. Um, and there's so much to explore there. I'm really excited about getting into it. So, um, one thing I wanted to ask early on because it's very distinct to you um, is the edutainment uh, style. Um, so, when did you develop that style that became so successful, um, especially in those early years in Italy? Was it something that you built up over time? And how much did experience with students play, play into it? And, and also, how did the choreography play into it? Okay, so here we need to open a parenthesis. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and I need to explain that in 2006 and seven, I mm -hmm. went to work in South Korea. So I left Italy for some time. I went to work in South Korea. I got hired by a very special project called English Village Paju. And, or it's, it's actually called Gyeonggi English Village. Um, and this whole educational concept was built around the idea of edutainment. So combining education with entertainment. So the idea was, um, it was like a small theme park and it was a full immersion English speaking experience where people would come from all over Korea and even other countries too for a day or even a week in this place where they would do all kinds of fun activities. And the idea is immerse people in something enjoyable so they don't realize they're learning. This is the whole concept. So, for example, we had a multicultural cooking class. We had um, the clinic where you would go and pretend to be a patient. We had a travel agency, a bank, a police station. And in every single place, there was a lesson with a song and a dance. Okay. Oh, cool. Right. So they hired professional performers like myself. There were 20 edutainers that... Uh, had been professional edutain uh, entertainers of different types. So like I'm a dancer and choreographer. We also had musicians, singers, um, all kinds of artists that you could imagine, like um, people that, that write music, people that design costumes. So the full spectrum uh, in this group of 20 people and uh, actors, of course. And so we, in addition to these classes we had, we also had full-scale professional musicals that we wrote, designed the set for, designed the costumes, and performed in. So it was oh. an amazing experience because there were full musicals that were original that we wrote, and every m musical had an educational element, and we always broke that fourth wall. So we used to talk to the audience you know, at, at certain points, we'd be performing, we'd be singing and dancing and doing a musical number. And all of a sudden, we would stop and address the audience and ask them to like sing along with us or answer questions or repeat something so that they were involved in the show. Even though we were on stage, all the people in the audience were involved in doing things. Right. So it was a really fantastic experience. This is how I got introduced to the concept of edutainment. So then when I went back to Italy in 2007, I started my own small version of that in Italy. Um, it, it wasn't anywhere near the, the English village, but I took one of the concepts and adapted it to my business. So basically I was, you know, teaching English lessons and classes and group, you know, group classes in my home. But in addition to that, I was running these big educational events outside of you know, outside of the homeschool thing. And uh, I would rent a public place like a, you know, restaurant or bar or, or public uh, theater or something, invite anyone who wants to come. And then they had to come. And once I entered the door, they had to speak English. There was no Italian allowed. And every event had a different theme. So, for example, one of them that I remember that I really enjoyed was about traveling. So, there were suitcases full of stuff all over the place, okay? And people had to uh, get in teams and get a suitcase, one suitcase for each team. And then they had to put a blindfold on and reach inside the suitcase, pull out something and use modal verbs to say what they thought it was. Like, oh, this could be sunscreen. 
oh, this might be an umbrella. Uh, this might be flip-flops, you know, just to practice using might, could, should, must, etc. So there was a task and then there was a fun, con- fun uh, activity along with it. And there were all kinds of things going on. Uh, you know, for example, you had to go around the room and ask questions to everybody that was there. And the fastest person who got all the answers, you know, um, to all the questions on the list won a prize. And I used to have three additional mother tongue teachers that would circle around and like talk to people and generate conversation and help them with the activities. Uh, sometimes I had a like a giant board game. It was similar to Jeopardy, where I had the answer and people had to come up with a question. So one of the challenges that Italian English speakers face is uh, formul- formulating questions correctly. So this was an exercise in developing their questions correctly. For example, they always leave out the auxiliary, do or does. So they had to, you know, get an answer and then make a que- make the question that would get that answer correctly, grammatically in English. And then they would, you know, they would win some points and then there, there were teams. And, you know, so there were lots and lots of different unique activities that I used to do with people in these edutainment events. And it got really popular. My school was famous around town and the events got bigger and bigger and bigger. Sometimes I had like a hundred people at the events. Wow, and right. it was it was really fun, really a lot of fun. That sounds incredible. I, I just I wish I had something like that for French and German in school because I'd be fluent. That's <laughs> just I, I wrote English. Or, sorry, wrote languages. It's it's just it's just not quite the same. That sounds like amazing fun for everyone involved. So um, obviously, as well as putting your all into you know performing and teaching, um, you had to obviously cover the the business side of things as well. So. What challenges did you face starting a business in Italy as an American? Uh, were, there, were there any barriers or were you really encouraged by local authorities, uh, people in um, business leaders in Vicenza, other people in business? W- what was it like kind of coming and setting up a business as, a, I guess, like a, a, a foreigner? This is a really good question and a good point. And it seems like a really difficult task, but actually it's it's so, so easy. And as it happened for me, I was actually kind of lucky. And when I got here, I kind of got pushed into it without even realizing it. So what happened was in my first few months that I was in Italy, I, uh, I met some people. One of them was uh, an accountant. Okay. He, mm. he was actually one of my students. And, you know, he said to me, you should open a partita Eva. Okay. What is a partita Eva? Partita Eva is a, like a business license number in Italy. Mm. He's like, you should open this number and start offering your services freelance. And I was like, okay, well, let's do this. Let's open this partita Eva. (laughs) I had no idea what it was all about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I opened the partita Eva and that rendered me eligible to, you know, offer freelance services. And to be honest, my visa for Italy was still under process. Uh, it's a really long story. I, I don't know if I even have time to explain it. But in the end, when I got my, um, they call it visa per lavoro autonomo, it means uh, visa for autonomous work or independent work. Um, having that partita okay. Eva was something that helped me get my visa. Actually, you should apply for the partita Eva after you get the visa. But in my case, it happened before. And it helped me get the visa. And anyway, um, things just went on from there. So, uh, yeah, the the immigration process for Italy is, it's not that easy. To be honest, it's still not very easy. In those days, and I'm talking 2004 was the year that I came here. So it's nearly 20 years back. Um, It was even more ambiguous. No one, there was no clear process about anything. Nobody knew how to process visa documents for an expat. My school that I initially came to work for had a lot of difficulties and, you know, it it took a really long time. But anyway, um, that's how it happened. I had a friend who helped me. I got the partita Eva and that was my kind of ticket to start doing, doing services as a business person. And that also permits you to then change it into different types of companies. So, 
you, when, when you get like my partita Eva was just uh, at, as a, like an individual person, me doing business, like independent contractor, freelancer. But then later I transformed it into a different type. The same number gets, you know, you can upgrade it. So when I opened my actual school, which was later on in, in Italy, it was in 2009, 10. Mm -hmm. um, when I opened the school, sorry, that was in 2007, excuse me, the second time when I came back from Korea, um, I was able to then upgrade it to a different type where it was an actual, you know, business with a physical location. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's some journey. So, um, in the next section, we're going to talk about, uh, about how, how things ended in Italy the first time and some of the travels and uh, job experiences that you took up. Feeling inspired? Fancy trying something completely new? We'll make your best move yet by signing up for a TEFL course with the most highly accredited provider on the planet. Here at the TEFL Org, we offer a range of online and classroom courses that you can study at your own pace. All of our courses include top-of-the-range teaching materials and come with dedicated tutor support from experienced and highly qualified TEFL experts. And what's more, we'll give you money off to do it. Just enter the code PODCAST at checkout to get 50% off any of our internationally recognised TEFL courses. And that includes our best-selling 120-hour Premier Online course. With that code, you'll not only get 50% off, but you'll also get a free lesson plans pack. Within a matter of months, you could be a qualified TEFL teacher, out there exploring the world, or working to your own schedule from home as an online English teacher. Just use the code PODCAST at checkout to get started. Okay, and we're back with uh, Cheryl Obel. So it sounded like things were going pretty swimmingly in Italy, um, but then you decided to take on some new challenges uh, in countries we'll talk about specifically um, a bit later on. So, so what was behind, you know, leaving Italy? Okay, well, I left Italy on several different occasions to pursue other opportunities. For example, the one we already discussed uh, the first time in Korea. Mm -hmm. I ended up going back to Korea but the first time in Korea, 2006 and seven, I had that opportunity with in the English village. But of course, I, I always wanted to come back to Italy. So I came back. I stayed a few more years and I started my master's degree here in Italy in 2008. Mm -hmm. So I was studying from 2008 to 2010 and at the same time running the business, which was really, really, really challenging. Um, I used to run the school from Monday to Thursday, then close the doors and spend every minute, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, doing my research, my, my paper, writing papers I had to write, submitting assignments, etc. And finally, in 2010, I finished. Now, why I left Italy was because the focus of my master's studies, um, it was actually human rights law. The, the degree mm. was called International Peace Operators, which means uh, it's a specific degree for people that want to work in humanitarian work. So I had this other passion to work in humanitarian work. Like I thought one day I want to work in a branch of the UN or um, in one of those big NGOs like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International. I had this dream. And so this degree was specifically for people in, in those fields. So we studied conflict resolution, war and peace, what, what causes war and conflict, um, you know, intercultural communication, business of uh, international organizations and, and how they run, all these kinds of things we studied. And my focus I took was on human rights. That was one of our big subject areas. And I chose that for my thesis. And I thought, I always wanted to go to India because my brother married an Indian girl. This is another thing. Half of my family is from India. So I'm like, I love India so much. And I thought, well, let me do some research on the human rights situation in India as the focus of my thesis. And that way I have an excuse to travel there. <laughs> so I was going to India in the summers, right? So yeah. I was, you know, running my school in the, in the, like, you know, from, from September to June. 
And then July and August, I used to spend in India for my research, for writing my thesis, for doing field work, volunteer work with different NGOs in the human rights field. And after two summers of doing that, I was like, I love India so much. It's not enough to go in the summer. I I have to live here. Like, Uh that's it. I need to leave Italy. I had this intense pull to just spend a long time in India. I really just needed to, to, I don't know what, where it came from. I just had this massive attraction to the culture and the life there and all of its challenges as well. I didn't, um, I wasn't afraid, even though it, it is a kind of, it, it's not the easiest place for, for a Westerner to live, let's say, mm. but I wanted that challenge. So let's say in, okay, so in 2011, I had a job offer from Microsoft in India. And on the same day, so this is, this is how you know things are destiny. On the same day, I had the call from Microsoft in India. Was this, the same day the people that owned the building where I had my school came and sat down in my school and told me that they were selling the building. Wow. So it, it seemed like destiny. I was like, all right, I have to get out of this space anyway. I don't know where I'm going to move my school to. And I got this call to go work in India. Hmm, this must be my destiny. So I figured it was my destiny. And I left Italy at that time. And I moved to India, just packed everything up and joined Microsoft as a culture and communication specialist. Mm-hmm. Now, that actually leads perfectly onto my next question, because I'm really fascinated <laughs> by the work that you did with Microsoft. So can you talk to... Uh, Obviously, you you said what you did, but could you talk through the kind of day to day of that, and and how did uh, knowledge of languages and 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 teaching how did that play a part into what you ended up doing with Microsoft? Definitely, good question. Um, this experience with Microsoft was it was a kind of uh, turning point in my career. It changed the whole trajectory of my career. Whatever I did afterwards was influenced by this time in Microsoft. It was an intense period. And uh, it was very difficult to get in. There were five or six very intense and long interviews with with lots of psychometric testing. And it was very difficult to, to actually land the job. So once I did, I was like, I, I can't believe I got through this. And then the first month, actually for me, it was six weeks because I came in the middle of a month. So it ended up being six weeks of very intense training during mm-hmm. which almost everybody breaks down and cries at one point, including me. <laughs> I had wow. to cry at one point because it was just so intense because they trained us on their systems and then they tested you and tested you and tested you and tested you. Um, but it was all worth it because everything I learned in that period was just irreplaceable. So I was hired as a culture and communication specialist, even though at that time I was not a cultural anything. I didn't really even know that there was a thing called cross-cultural training. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was a language instructor. Yes, I had cross-cultural life experience because I'd lived in different countries. I'd I'd had a business in in a country, not my own Italy. And, and, you know, I had, I had lived in Korea. So yeah, I had some cultural experience, but when I was at Microsoft, they introduced me to the concept of cross-cultural training. Okay. And they trained us to be cross-cultural trainers in addition to being language instructors. So we would combine, you know, linguistic instruction with cultural competence instruction. So basically cross-cultural training, what is it? It's teaching people how to work with other cultures and it's something beyond language. It's about how people think, how, how people work, how people do business, how people negotiate, how they view leadership. Uh, it can go on so many different levels. And, you know, it's about how our cultural conditioning shapes us into the person we are, shapes our mind and makes us behave in the way that we do. And we all have a, a cultural conditioning from, from the place that we come from. So our job as culture and communication specialists uh, was to train the Indian uh, support engineers. They were 
in the DS cluster development support. And they were working with high-end American clients. So, of course, apart from providing, you know, excellent, stellar customer service, they had to be culturally appropriate, which is a challenge whenever you're working across borders. I mean, if I'm going to go work in, you know, Germany, for example, I have to study the German mentality and I have to understand how they view certain things and how I can, you know, um, I can adapt to their culture and not offend them. So there were lots of lessons for the, the Indian support engineers around American culture, American mindset, American expectations, um, linguistic differences, because Indians speak English very well and their genius level, you know, uh, software engineers, uh, just sometimes they needed some help to understand how their American clients were thinking and what their American clients were expecting. And so that was where we came in was to, to educate them. So how the job was, I would actually listen to calls and read their emails on a daily basis. We had a scoring system, like a rubric, and we would rate each and every call and call that we listened to and email that we read, we would give it a score. And then, of course, we would give feedback like, okay, you did this really well. Um, however, you could improve on this aspect. So basically, we would identify areas that needed improvement by listening to calls and reading emails. And based on what we heard and observed, we would conduct um coaching sessions, either one-on-one -on -one or small group coaching or even group training. So there were three different formats. And we had what we called a focus group. It was a group of 30 guys that were identified as having some need for some assistance. And we would follow that group of 30 guys for three months. And in the three months, like each month there was, we had quotas, like we had we had to fulfill, you know, X number of coaching sessions, X number of calls we had to listen to, X number of emails we had to read, and we had to we had to check off all the boxes for each and every one of the 30 people and meet them, you know, and just provide um, some training and, and help and then some follow-up. So we would, you know, after the session, listen to the next calls and see if it was improved and read the next emails and, you know, just make sure that whatever we were teaching them was getting applied and they were actually improving on their customer service ratings. Mm -hmm. There's so much in that that I'd love to explore, but um, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking about how that job. I mean, maybe you'll you'll agree, but that that, that combines so many of the things that came before in your career. So you've got the organization yes. factor from choreography. There's the performance element of it as well, because I think whether you're teaching or training, there is an element of performance. Um, and of course, you know, the, the cultural awareness you have from having traveled as a dancer and a choreographer, and it just feels like the culmination of so many of those different things along with kind of teaching English. Would that be a fair assessment? Absolutely. Yeah, you're bang on. I mean, I did feel like I was combining a lot of my skills, uh, my past experience working in different cultures, um, you know, uh, language instruction, performing. Absolutely. I mean, all of those elements were there. Uh, but the most important things were like discipline and hard work because our workload was huge. And in fact, uh -huh. whenever I used to get my targets at the beginning of every month, I used to cry a little bit every month. Like, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to reach these targets. There was a great deal of pressure because Microsoft being, you know, a multinational, there's a reason why it's such a successful company it's because they have really good system set up. It's, it, it really challenges you and squeezes everything out of you. But in the end, you learn a lot. And every month I made my targets, even though I never thought I could. <laughs> but yeah, it, it did use all of my skills and past experience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot to learn there for people who are, are listening and, and watching this, that you, you can combine so much, you know, um, and when you go on to teach English, there's so much you can do with it that's outside the uh, Absolutely. of teaching English. Um, You're okay, so, so right, because I mean, 
Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just wanted, I was just saying you're right about um, there's so much more you can do as an English teacher. There's so many more opportunities out there besides just your typical classroom instruction and, you know, using a book and doing grammar lessons and, and stuff. There's lots of other opportunities that are there for people with this kind of training and background. Um, and there's also one more thing I didn't, I didn't, uh, explain that I probably should. So I mentioned that I was trying to work in the field of humanitarian work or international human rights. Uh, since I didn't find that kind of job at that time and I had the Microsoft offer, I went for Microsoft, but in the side, I was doing all kinds of other activities in India for uh, human rights. I was doing a lot of volunteer work and different campaigns I was involved in with NGOs locally in there in Bangalore, India, uh, around the same time that I was there with Microsoft. And, and then later I went back to India um, and I, and I eventually did work for an NGO, but that was later on. It took me some time to get a job in the field because it, I was new to that field really when I, you know, got the master's degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to explore all that as well. Don't worry. Um, that's, uh, we're, we're going to specifically kind of look at how your, your career experience to that point really informed your work with NGOs. Uh, and uh, we're just going to take another quick break. We'll be right back with Cheryl, who's going to tell us all about that. Are you looking for a weekly guide to what's going on in the TEFL world? Do you want some advice on everything from job interviews to underrated TEFL destinations? Well, the TEFL Work blog has it all. Every single week, we tackle some of the biggest questions in the TEFL industry. Stay up to date with the latest trends in English teaching, find tips to make your next job application your best yet, or get inspired and read about the experiences of TEFL Org graduates teaching all around the world. Whether you're brand new to the industry, or you've seen it all, we can guarantee an interesting read each week. To find out more, go to tefl.org forward slash blog. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G forward slash blog. So uh, what you do now is based around culture and uh, communication. And you've already touched on it. Um, obviously, you know, you, you, you covered with your master's, um, the work that you did for, for Microsoft, but how specifically does uh, your experience teaching English fit into what you do in terms of culture and, and, and communication? Well, definitely, this is a good question. And um, when you're a cross-cultural trainer, you end up using your past experience as an ESL teacher. And of course, language is an element of culture. So. Uh, most ESL teachers are kind of halfway there because even in the course of our ESL teaching, we normally have, you know, some cultural lessons. Like most ESL t textbooks have some sections on culture and different places. And so we end up talking about culture. Uh, the only difference now is that I'm an actual certified cross-cultural trainer, which, um, to be honest, it started at Microsoft, of course. I, I didn't get like certified at that time, but we got introduced to many different methodologies. And one of them was cultural detective. And we also did the globe smart profiling, uh, cultural profiling and assessment. We also did the IDI intercultural development index and the ICS inter intercultural conflict styles, um, assessment. So this is where I, I got introduced to everything and I started teaching a little bit in the, in the area of cross-cultural competence. But let's say that I got certified finally in 2017 with cultural detective and 2018 with the Lewis model and 2021 with globe smart. So I have three certifications. I got them kind of one by one. And all that time I was evolving my uh, methodology with teaching cross-cultural studies. And I had a lot of experiences along the way. If you wanna go back to 2012 and 13, when I left, I had a year in Microsoft India. After that, I went back to Korea, to Seoul, Korea this time. 
not to the English village, but I was working for a company that used to send me all over the country to conduct corporate training courses. So here I was kind of not an English teacher anymore. I was more of a corporate trainer and I had three or four um, topics and we had these workbooks. One of them was cross-cultural skills. Then another one was presentation skills, then business writing, and then negotiation skills. Those were my four core topics. And they used to send me to multinational companies to spend anywhere from one day up to six weeks. Sometimes I would spend six weeks in a company's training center outside of Seoul, outside of the city, and conduct these really intense eight hour per day and sometimes 10 hours per day of training for um, Korean uh, staff members that were freshly hired for uh, to work in a company like a multinational like Samsung or Hyundai or one of those multinational companies. Um, sometimes they were executives. And one time I had a group of about 25 Korean executives that were going from Seoul to do um, a mini MBA in the U.S. and then try and open business, like expand their business in um, four countries in South America. So that training program consisted of a lot of things. It was six weeks. They had business writing, presentation skills. They had cross-cultural competence and specific for four countries. I think it was like Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and Peru, I think, or maybe Colombia was one of them. Uh, anyway, they had some cultural lessons on each of those countries and Spanish. Like I taught also Spanish at the time, like basics like Spanish greetings and, and uh, conversation so that they could, you know, just have some basic, you know, Spanish interaction once they arrived. And these guys were like, you know, we're talking 50, 55 year old, very Korean guys who had never lived abroad. So it was, you know, it was an interesting experience, I think for, for me and as well for them. So anyway, um, so that was 2012 and 2013 um, there were lots of other experiences in the, in the middle. I don't know how much detail you want to go into. I also worked in Qatar. So I was still dancing and choreographing all this time. Like in every right. country I lived, I was, I was still dancing and choreographing on the side and running dance classes, but as a part-time activity. And in 2014, I was hired as a choreographer for the Qatar National Day celebration. Like, to choreograph mass movement performances that were part of the opening ceremony of Qatar National Day. So wow. that was kind of going back to my roots as a choreographer, but it was a, it was a huge project and it was my first experience with the culture of the Arab Gulf. And that was also an, something that combined my teaching experience, my cultural background, dance and choreography, because what I had to do was research the culture of Qatar, like the culture and the history, and include elements of that in a performance that sort of trace the trajectory of their history from the past to the present day, ending in, guess what, the World Cup. Because back then, of in tw 2014, they were already planning for the World Cup. So that was eight years ago, but they were still, they were already like well underway, uh, planning, building, and everybody was excited about it. So, you know, the point was to like show like, this is where we were, you know, we used to be, um, you know, in, I'm talking about in the past tribal, uh, pearl divers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we modernized, we became, you know, a city and now we're soon we're hosting the world cup. So I had to show like movement that explained all these things. I, I know it sounds crazy, but um, well, it was, it was a really interesting experience. That's just, yeah, that's, that is utterly wild. Like I just, I, and also like, I think for a lot of people there's a lot of inspiration there because, you know, while you're doing all these incredible, um, making all these incredible career moves, you know, Microsoft and, uh, working in Korea as well, you always were able to keep that passion 
a lot you've been actually turn it into into work as well which I, I think a lot of people are maybe people listening or watching don't realize that they can actually have the best of both where you know something that you're passionate about in terms of a career can go well but also your you know your the, the passions that have been sort of longer held than that they they can go into into what you do uh, for a living as well so um there's another role that you've done that really, that really fascinates me. I mean, they all do. I mean, it's an incredible story. Um, but you worked as a vice president of Right to Live, um, which, if I've done my research correctly, is an organization that specializes in fundraising for uh, poor patients, um, for education programs, and for medical science in India. Uh, now, part of that, yes. I'm guessing, was liaising with big name donors, some of which were from America. So yes. that's that's quite that's quite something. So what skills from teaching came into play there? And, and was it primarily okay. about relationship building with stakeholders, that kind of thing? Yes. OK, good question. So after Qatar, after 2014, then I went back to India in 2015 and 16. And that's when I finally fulfilled my dream of working for an NGO and doing something good for humanity. And yes, the organization Right to Live was based around uh, raising money for, for health care. At the time okay. I was in it, it was only about health care. Now they're okay. doing educational programs and, and other things, supporting villages. Uh, but at, at that time, it was uh, it's actually India's first crowdfunding platform. It's not the oh. biggest. There are others in India, like Indiegogo, uh, that are bigger now, um, and a couple others. But... Right to Live was the first, okay? And mm. so we were raising money for poor people to get medical treatment. There were often people that, you know, didn't have the money to go get treatment, and so their disease reached a certain stage where it was critical. Uh, for example, they needed a tumor removed, or they, they needed a heart surgery, or they, uh, you know, we had a lot of leukemia patients, a lot of kidney patients. And, yes, mm. I was kind of going into, uh, I think I went to every slum in Bangalore and every hospital at one point. I was always in and out of hospitals. I used to go and negotiate with the hospitals to bring down the cost of the surgery. So you okay. know, we would usually manage to raise a portion of or most of the cost of the person's surgery or treatment. But sometimes we didn't reach the, the goal of raising the full amount. So I would go in and negotiate with the social workers of the hospital and say, okay, look, this is what we've managed to raise. Would you be able to bring down the cost of the surgery considering this person is critical and they're the breadwinner of the family? And usually they would say yes. Or we would manage right. to find some other donor uh, through the hospital and, and patch up whatever was missing. And yes, we did have relationships with multinational companies most of them that, you know, were based there in India or they were, let's say, yeah, a lot of American companies that had their delivery center or support center there in Bangalore because Bangalore okay, is one yeah. of the hubs of, of IT uh, in India. So there were lots and lots of, you know, like Microsoft. I had been in Microsoft and there were lots of other multinational company branches there. And so... Yes, a lot of them were our partners. So I used to set up these volunteer programs in partnership with the, the multinationals. So most multinationals had a CSR program or corporate social responsibility. And through those programs, they would encourage their staff to volunteer and they would partner with different local NGOs. And we were one of them. So for example, uh, we would get, let's say, 10 people from Thomson Reuters company, and they would spend all day with us. And they would come with us to the hospital. They would help us do the patient interviews and the social worker discussions, you know, the negotiation on the cost of surgery. They would help us do the intake of new patients and lots of different things. I mean, it was a full-scale NGO being run by only three people, me being one of them, so there was a lot of work, everything from social media campaigns to website development to calling other volunteers to organizing events and walkathons and you know other other um, volunteer events with other corporates as well. So the, they were involved in in anything that they thought they could add value in. So if they were good at campaigning, we would put them into campaigning. If they wanted to have contact with the patients, they would come with us for hospital visits. 
And so it was kind of all, all across the board. Some of them helped us organize the walkathon and then, you know, participated in the walkathon as well. Or, and so then the, the corporate would give us a donation for every hour that every person spent with us. So it was a kind of exchange program where we gave their employees a good volunteering experience. And in, in exchange, they donated a certain amount to the organization for our work. And the unique thing about that organization is that 100% of whatever we collected went for the patients. So how were we able to do that? Like, how were we able to have such a model where 100% of our donations went to the people in need? It's because that NGO is part of a company called Optimix. Mm. And that's where my employment came in. I was actually employed by Optimix and Optimix was paying my salary so that once we collected donations, 100% of the donations went to the people who needed it. We didn't mm. allow anything to be taken for administrative costs or, you know, anything at all, printing brochures or any cost that an NGO has. They were never paid for by donors' uh, donations. I mean, the, the donations went 100% to the people. And I was supervising this whole thing. So I can vouch for the fact that this really was happening. And uh, so I was employed by Optimix. And since I was a language and cultural instructor, I was working half-time in Optimix as a trainer and half-time in Right to Live as the vice president. So I had the two jobs. I mean, they were like split roles, let's say. But it was all under the same roof. Optimix was a, an IT company and uh, based, again, in the U.S. with their delivery center in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yes, I did similar things, cross-cultural training, because a lot of those employees were going to the U.S. to visit uh, their their clients and spend a week with them. So they needed cultural training, some help with language and, you know, writing emails, writing professional emails to their clients. And so I was doing that half time and half time I was running the NGO. That is, <laughs> I'm going to say this a lot because every time you answer a question, it's like, I, I cannot believe it. It's, it's incredible. Um, but it just seems like such a rich tapestry of like, I didn't even, the... yeah, was... sorry to interrupt you. I didn't even tell you everything because I don't know how much time I have, <laughs> but um, uh, one more thing. Mm -hmm. While so on the side, so this is my full time job, but it was a split role, right to live and Optimix. On the side, like in my free time, I was teaching dance for two professional dance companies. One of them was called Nuritrutya. It's it's one of India's most famous, or maybe the most famous, Indian contemporary dance company. They travel all over the world and perform. Mm -hmm. They're very famous, and um, they're called Nuritrutya. It's a really hard name to pronounce. But um, I was teaching their professional dancers twice a week at seven in the morning. The class started. It was advanced contemporary dance. So I used to ride my bike from my house. Believe it or not, in, in India, I used to travel around by bicycle, even though it's such a chaotic place and the streets full of traffic and, and scooters and cows and, and ox carts and everything, monkeys. I was still riding my bike to get around. So I used to, it was a triangle. I used to ride my bike from home to the dance school, hmm. teach an hour and a half intense, advanced contemporary dance, quickly take a shower and ride my bike to the company, which was another, you know, 10 minute bike ride and work all day and then, and then come back home and then crash. So that was, that was my, my life. And not only that company, but another company called Left Foot Right Dance Works. Mm -hmm. On the weekends, I used to go over there and, and teach their professional performers different uh, choreography. And I, we also did shows. I mean, of course, when you, when you teach dance, there's always a performance here and there. So mm -hmm. a lot of times I was pre preparing them for performances. I mean, I'm exhausted just by hearing about that schedule. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think yeah. I need to, I need to yeah. be sleep just hearing that. Schedule. That's absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> So it's all going on in India, obviously, um, you know, you've got lots of different things on lots of really, really high achieving projects, but later on you establish yourself in Saudi Arabia. We've already touched on kind of the Middle East yes. uh, with your experience in Qatar, but, um, you know, first as a cross cultural, uh, you know, doing, doing cross cultural activities as, as an English language teacher in, in Jeddah. Um, so. What, yes. was, what was that challenge like and, 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 and what else was kind of happening in Saudi Arabia at that time and, for you? 
Okay, great. So in 2016, when um, that project I was doing in India was coming to an end, I sort of thought that, you know, I remembered my experience in Qatar and how amazing it was to, to be in the Mideast Gulf. So I thought maybe I would like to go back. And I had a friend who was working in Saudi Arabia. So I wrote to her to ask her, you know, how is it? Do you like it? How are you getting on? And at that time in 2016, I didn't know much about Saudi Arabia, only what I heard in the news. And, you know, Saudi Arabia doesn't have a great image, let's say, out there in the news. Uh, there's a lot of negative publicity that is either out of date, um, very negative, or just completely untrue, which is what I found when I started talking to people who had been there, including my friend and other people that I knew in India. Like I had one of my best friends from India, two people actually that I was really close to in India were born in Saudi Arabia, and they told me loads of positive things about it. And the friend that I called in Saudi Arabia uh, also said a lot of positive things. And I thought, hmm, okay, maybe it's not what everybody says. And all right. And she said, you know, we're actually, we actually have a, an open position right now in the university. And that was KAUST, King Abdullah University for Science and Technology. And she said, why don't you apply? I said, all right, uh, let me apply. I mean, I had no idea if I was going to get the job or, or not. But I thought, why not? As a start, I'll apply. So I applied. I went through the interview process and everything. And to my surprise, they offered me the job. And the job was teaching staff business English. Okay, that's how it started. Right. So I got hired as a business English instructor for staff. And the staff of the university came from all over the world. So we had like 120 different nationalities at KAUST. And, um, of course, most of them were non-native speakers of English, but the operating language at the university was English. So, okay. you know, I had everything from finance professionals to scientists, you know, postdoc scientists were in my classes, uh, all kinds of different professionals from all over the world, all mixed in with Saudis because the university was about half Saudi and about half from all the rest of the world, let's say. And um, it was probably the most amazing teaching experience I've ever had, to be honest. Right. Um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of the students, the, the quality of the, the students, what we were teaching, our facilities. Um, and, of course, it was the highest paid ESL job I, I ever had. Um, of course, tax-free and everything it allows you to save a lot. Um, and you finally feel like you're being paid what you're worth, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the place I was living was amazing because we all lived on the university campus and it was all like its own little self-contained town that was like very, uh, well protected. They had really good security and like 300 security guards. Goodness. Uh, and it was, um, it was like a little city on the, the coast of the Red Sea. We had our own beaches. We had our own movie theater, even though at that time, movie theaters were not allowed in Saudi Arabia. We mm -hmm. had our own movie theater on campus. We had restaurants, supermarkets. I mean, anything you would need. Um, giant, you know, fitness centers with Olympic sized pools. And it's just an, an amazing place to live and work. And I feel very, very, very fortunate to have had that experience. So I started out as a business English instructor. And then I was like, hmm, this is a very multicultural place, but there's no cross-cultural training. And you have people coming from all over the world, and they're not given any preparation. And they're coming to Saudi Arabia, okay? Many of them have never lived abroad. They have to adjust to the culture of Saudi Arabia, which is quite different from a lot of other countries in the world. And they have to adapt to working in a very diverse environment. So I suggested that we start doing cross-cultural training. And I, I proposed the course and everything. And they accepted it. They accepted the proposal. They let me try it. They let me run a pilot. It had excellent feedback. And so I continued running it. And this is more on the training side. This is not in the ESL team. It was more on the, you know, there was a, 
there was a small team of ESL <laughs> teachers, and then there was the training, the L&D, learning and development department. And so that um, cross-cultural training was for that department. It was like open to the university. It was, it was a training course, not a language course. So um, that's where it all started. I mean, in terms of like um, my, my experience in Saudi, my, my training and cross-cultural experience. And then it just grew from there. I kept running that course. Um, it had excellent feedback all the way through. And I learned a lot because of course, when you teach, you, you, you know, you gather feedback and then you improve it and you, you look at what works, what doesn't work. Like I, it was a great laboratory for me to experiment with different training practices in, the, in a classroom, you know, with professionals. So I used to have 20 per group and we used to do a lot of, you know, um, discussions, role plays, activities, everything around cross-cultural and uh, fantastic experience. And then I started doing other training courses as well. So I was kind of halfway in the training team and half of me was still in the English department. So now you're back in Italy, you run uh, Cheryl Obel and Associates, uh, which specializes in, in cross-cultural training. And if I've got this right, preparing people from all over the world to do business and build relationships across the world. Uh, now that to me, that looks and sounds like a combination of all the skills and all the job roles you've had. And it, and it all started with, well, with English teaching. Is, is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, that's where my whole, you know, teaching and training career started. I felt like it was an essential part of my training abilities. I mean, being a classroom trainer, class, classroom teacher in English gives you the teaching skills that you need to then become a trainer. It's really just, it's a very similar skill set that's transferable from English teaching to corporate training, which is what I call what I'm doing now. I wouldn't call it teaching, it's corporate mm -hmm. training because it's being a facilitator. So basically my role is to generate discussions through which people make their own discoveries. And that's, that's basically what a facilitator does. I'm not a lecturer, I'm not uh, standing up there and doing uh, grammar lessons, but um, I'm trying to lead people to make certain discoveries. Of course, I explain certain things, but I give short explanations and then right away it's time to do a group activity or it's time to do a role play or it's time to discuss something through which they come to their own conclusions. And that's how training works. I mean, that's how training is effective, let's say. It should have maximum trainee participation, which is very similar to ESL teaching because what we're trying to do is get people to speak English as much as possible, right? In an ESL classroom, um, most of our teaching was around uh, getting people to practice their conversation and getting them to improve their skills. And you only improve through doing, right? And I remember that in yeah. my ESL training, uh, I learned the 75-25 model, which was, you know, the, the teacher should only ever speak 25% of the time because 75% of the time should be for the students to practice and speak. So I applied the same model, more or less, to, to classroom training. And it, it always seemed to work for the, for the corporate training as well. And um, so now that I'm doing, so now that I have this business, okay, yes, I combined a lot of my previous experiences um, my certifications, my, my whole, all my studies and everything into this business. And it's, it's basically, I'm, I'm a solopreneur. I do have people that work for me. I have three virtual assistants that work from three different countries. One of them is in Venezuela. One is in the Philippines and one is in Saudi. And, um, so, besides those three employees, it's really just me and then some people that I collaborate with. My associates are people that all have their own businesses and we do different projects at different times together, but I'm the primary trainer and, you know, I'm, I'm the, the real one woman show. So basically I'm providing corporate training on cross-cultural skills, communication skills, 
I mean, from presentations to business writing to negotiation to uh, you name it. I mean, there's a lot of skills, persuasion techniques, etc. And personal development, like um, problem solving skills and personal branding, leadership, things like that. And then I do train the trainer courses as well. I train other ESL teachers and I train other cross-cultural trainers too. So uh, basically I have corporate clients all over the world, mostly in Saudi, some in the US, the UK, Germany, Italy, of course, India, and you know, at different times, sometimes I have clients long-term Sometimes I have clients for just one day because they want just one course or a seminar or a lecture and then that's it. Uh, others like are ongoing clients that I have courses going for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So most of it is done online. Like most of it, this whole business was born in the pandemic. It was born in 2020 when I left the job in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, uh, you know, virtual business was huge and working at home was, was a big thing. So that's why it started like, like a digital business. And I do have some pre-recorded courses on Udemy platform. And, uh, a lot of my training is done through zoom or through teams. And then sometimes I visit the clients now that travel is possible again. Um, actually since last December, like last year, 2021, uh, when travel became easier, that was the first time I left after being, you know, working at home for a year and a half, building up the business, building up the digital marketing strategy and the content online and all of that. Uh, then I finally got invited once, you know, travel was okay again, back to Saudi, back to the same employer, Kaust. Oh, and right. I okay. Kept going back there to yeah. So actually when I left there, I had an agreement with, um, the HR director at the time that we, we kind of, you know, we said we wanted to stay in touch and he wanted me to keep doing the cross cultural training. And I told him that I, I wanted to open a business and he said, okay, as soon as your business is up and running, let me know. And, uh, we'd love to have you back to continue the training. So thankfully I'm very, 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 very thankful that I've kept my connection with Cal's because it's a place that changed my life um, personally, professionally, um, in, in many aspects, it, it really changed my life economically as well. It completely changed my life. So I'm, and, and besides that, it's just a fantastic place to live and work. It's, it's got the, the most amazing people in the world and um, the most amazing facilities and, just a, a really, 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 really positive experience. And, you know, living in Saudi Arabia was nothing of what I heard about it. And so now I'm a big advocate of going to the Middle East and experiencing it. I have a YouTube channel in which I talk about Saudi Arabia. There's lots of videos on expat life, um, intercultural skills and business in other countries. Those are the three topics. And I have several videos that talk about Saudi Arabia, my experience there, how positive it was, how amazing the people are, and how you can also um, expand your horizons by living and working there. Brilliant. Um, so beyond the kind of technical skills that you need for cross-cultural uh, training, but, uh, you know, I, I keep coming back to thinking about the sort of um, emotional literacy that you need um, amongst all the other litany of skills that you need for the for the kind of jobs that you've done uh, how, how much do you know empathy patience these skills play play a part in in, in cross-cultural training and in, in terms of what you've been able to build this is a, a really good point um it's really true that you need skills like empathy and patience uh because you you need to be able to listen to people a lot so the courses are not about me talking. Like I mentioned earlier, I try to let the people in the, in the courses talk as much as possible because only then they feel engaged, they feel interested. And a lot of this knowledge is intuitive. Okay. So a lot of it, they already know inside. And it's really about, um, you know, drawing out of them and, and confirming 
what they already thought or they already knew. Of course, I provide guidance. And the message that I always transmit in my courses is that, you know, there's no culture that's right or wrong or better or worse. And um, if, if there's anyone in the class that thinks that, I hope they go away understanding that that's, that's not the right way to be uh, culturally sensitive, okay? We all come with some degree of ethnocentricity, you know, thinking that my way is the right way and the only way. We all have that because it's a natural human thing. And it's, 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 um, created by our culture that we come from. I mean, I'm from the U.S. and in the U.S., we, we had lots of things drilled into our heads as kids. You know, we're the strongest country, the best economy, the best military, the, you know, yeah, okay. So you go away thinking like we, I'm the, we are the, we are the best, you know, this, that. And then, you know, what you have to realize in other to, in order to be culturally sensitive and to integrate into any culture is to leave all that behind and understand that, hey, I mean, we may not be the best. We are not actually, we're not the best <laughs> like in many ways, um, you know, and so everybody has positive aspects of their culture. There's nothing that we want to, there's, there's no reason to have stereotypes and, and have negative beliefs. And we have to see all the positives because even if we don't understand how or why somebody is behaving in a certain way with us, there's almost always some positive intent. You know, people are usually, people usually do have good intentions. There's usually positive intent, but we just don't realize where it's coming from. And that's what cross-cultural training helps you to decipher so there are certain techniques I use and certain models through which uh, you can really understand different cultural styles and start shedding those layers of, um, you know, ethnocentricity so that you can adapt to any culture. And one of them is the Lewis model. I find it very useful. It's a multicolored triangle. It shows you the relative placement of many countries in the world and how they, the, the tendencies that they have, because it's, it's not about rules. It's not about hard and fast rules. It's about a guideline to show us how people may collectively behave and think towards certain things like communication and business and work ethic and lots of different aspects. It's all about relationships. That's, that's what it comes down to in the end. So we're working on a lot of um, interpersonal relationship skills in this course, like, um, conflict resolution skills, you know, just, just everyday communication. I mean, I'm sure you can think of many instances when you've been working in different places or even in your own country, working with someone from abroad and you realize that, Hey, we're speaking the same language, but we're not understanding each other. Why is that? That's because Maybe they're a high context communicator and maybe you're a low context communicator or vice versa. So low context and high context are two terms that belong to the cross-cultural training field that I think in every cross-cultural course, you will see um, an explanation of these terms. They're two dimensions that people usually belong to um, either because of their culture of origin or because of their personality. So culture is not just about where you come from. It's also about your own personality. So there's, there's three parts, there's a pyramid and the bottom level is, you know, we teach that there's some parts of it that's human nature. There's parts of it that we share. There's needs and desires that are common to all humankind, like the need to eat, the need for shelter and things like that. Basic human survival, um, you know, um, fear and th things like certain fears of certain things and, and survival mechanisms. Okay. That's common to all humankind. The middle part, which is the thickest part is the cultural part. The one that's conditioned and shaped by all the groups you belong to in life, not just your country, but it could come from religion or your family. Your family is also a smaller cultural unit that, you know, inculcates some behaviors and some, some principles of, in, inside you. And the final la layer is the personality layer because everybody in this world is a unique individual that may have different beliefs that are different from their culture and different from other people's culture, even in the same family. So that's why we, we always teach that, 
you know, no matter what the cultural background is, you have to try and evaluate the, the individual that you have in front of you to try and understand their values, their communication style, and not attach a certain set of characteristics just because they come from a certain place. It can be a starting point. Uh, for example, you know, you can start by, by, by knowing that the general communication style in the U.S. and in Germany is pretty direct. Okay, yes, we have a direct communication style. So you can start with that thought, but then you have to refine it when you relate to every individual because every individual could be different from the, their home culture. Not every single person from the U.S. is a direct communicator. I mean, so that's why, you know, we teach these three layers and we emphasize that in the end, you have to understand the person, the individual, and not create a stereotype based on their origin. And also to let go of any, like, strong ethnocentric beliefs that you have about yourself and your own culture. And it's really about being open, being ready to adapt, being ready to learn. And anyone who has this set of characteristics can survive when they go abroad. A lot of my training has to do with people that are relocating, you know, either by themselves or on behalf of a multinational company going to live in another country. If they don't get this cross-cultural training, what happens? It's a very typical trend. They get to the new country. They haven't been given any training. They start becoming very negative. I'm sure you've seen this in different experiences. They start complaining about the local culture they start being very negative against locals. They start saying, this is the way it is. They shouldn't do that. They shouldn't do that. It's supposed to be like this. Well, it's supposed to be like that. Maybe where you're from, but okay. not here. Okay. You have to understand that when you live in another country, things are different and it's your job to adapt, not their job to adapt to you. You have to adapt to them. So without this cross-cultural tra sensitivity training, it's, it's, it's often, and I, I still see this sometimes, companies call me after they have sent staff abroad, and they're like, oh, we're having a lot of problems with this person. This person is arguing with the local. This person is not getting along with people. We don't know what to do. Yeah, because you, you didn't give them this training before they left. I'm not saying it's too late because I do train a lot of people after they've already landed in the foreign country and they start having problems and the company goes, oh my God, I need your help. Like, can you train this person? So it's at that point, it's kind of like remedial training and it's like calming them down and getting them to, you know, to accept. And they'll, they'll be saying things like, why do they do that? What? That's not right. Why do they do? Well, that's just the way it is. That's the way they behave. It, it's not wrong. It's not, you know, it's not that you're right and they're wrong or vice versa. It's just different. And it's up to us to find a way to adapt and integrate with it. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, um, there's so, so many lessons to take away from that. And I really, really hope people do. Um, now, just to wrap things up, we always are uh, keen to show people that the TEFL or ESL or TESOL certificates they can lead to all sorts of careers and pathways. And I think you're a perfect example of that. Um, but what advice do you wish you'd be given before you started on the, on, on the journey that uh, you, you talked to, to us about today? Okay, well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I achieved a TEFL certificate, okay. Um, why I didn't go for the CELTA, because oh. At a certain point in my career, actually, all the way through until I paid off my student loans and everything, mm -hmm. I could never take a full month off to study, okay? Yeah. And I know that the CELT is really intense. You should spend a whole month doing the course, and you have lots of homework, and this whole thing scared me. Like, oh, I can't because I need to, I need to work so I can pay my loans. I can't take a month off and pay for this course, which is usually $1,500 and a month off of work. So it's like, you have to think about that whole financial commitment. And, you know, but I actually, I wish I had gotten my CELTA because 
you know, the CELTA is really the ticket to the best jobs in the world. And I found that out by um, trial and error, like, you know, just applying for different jobs and finding that they were like, where's your CELTA, you know? Um, so I would recommend to anyone, if you can do it, get your CELTA, okay? Get it as soon as possible. Get it early on, take the month off, arrange for it financially in whatever way you can. Take a loan or, you know, take a loan from your parents or something and get the CELTA. That's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is that if you ever feel like ESL teaching is not satisfying enough for you, because it is a wonderful career, but at a certain point, you know, people tend to get burned out. I mean, I know I got burned out at a certain point because you end up working a lot, preparing a lot, and not earning much money. And especially when you're working in, you know, developing countries, let's say, they don't pay very much and you work a lot, you get burned out at a certain point. So then I would suggest, you know, considering the cross-cultural training field or just training in general, corporate training in general, because the skills that you have from ESL teaching are transferable. And with cross-cultural training, it's probably, it pays about five times more than ESL teaching. You get to travel even more because you get invited from other countries to to, to teach for like a week or two weeks or a month, you know, so you get many more opportunities to travel and you feel like you're using all of your skills. You're not only using teaching skills, classroom skills, but um, as you mentioned earlier, Yuan, you're using skills like empathy and, and active listening and, and classroom facilitation, slightly different from classroom teaching, but, you know, facilitating um, lots of other more in-depth discussions, you know, about culture and about certain, you know, concepts that belong to the cross-cultural training field. So those are my two pieces of advice. And beyond that, I would also say that nowadays there are so many opportunities to have a business with your skills. There's, you know, you can have an online, a digital business, like a, a digital teaching platform, or you can start a YouTube channel with useful content. Um, and there's lots of other avenues, record, pre-recorded courses on course platforms like Udemy. And there's lots of other ways you can make a living besides, you know, uh, classroom teaching that you would use your skills and use your teaching background as well. Brilliant. So uh, just to, to finish things off there, uh, where can people find you, Cheryl? You mentioned YouTube there. Yes, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Cheryl Obel cross-cultural communication expert. It's a really long title, but if you just enter my name, you'll find it. There are two YouTube channels. One of them is for dance. One of them is for culture and, and business abroad and stuff like that. And uh, they can also find me at my website, CherylObel.com. It's just my first name and last name attached.com. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. I'm not very active on Instagram uh, or, or Facebook, although, you know, a little bit here and there. And I would love to hear from, from teachers who are thinking about another path because I do train cross-cultural trainers and I have a network, an online network for people that are aspiring to become cross-cultural trainers or are already working in some degree uh, in the cross-cultural field. So all ESL teachers are welcome if they want to learn. There are free events every week, like seminars and webinars. Uh, different people come on and teach something and I also give a lot of free sessions. And I'll also be running a course and a series of workshops for people who want to become cross-cultural trainers, where I'm going to talk about all these things, the methodologies, how to become a trainer, how to promote yourself, how to do an online business, how to, uh, how to do a client intake, and how to build your training program and propose to new clients and all of that. So, yeah, I'd really like to hear from anyone who's interested. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for talking to us, Cheryl. And, um, yeah, uh, if, if you're interested in anything that... Uh, My pleasure. If, if you're interested in anything that Cheryl's uh, spoken about, you know, be sure to, to follow the uh, links she's given you there. And, again, Cheryl, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh You've been listening to I Taught English Abroad, a podcast series by the TEFL Org. 
keep up to date with every episode, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your streaming platform of choice. And we love feedback, so feel free to leave us a review on any platform you like. For more information about the TEFL org, or about teaching English as a foreign language in general, head on over to tefl.org. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>